Hey, Jason here. In today's video, I'm going to answer the question, should you buy Costco stock ticker C-O-S-T? This is stock analysis for picnicking pillowcase. Who requested this on YouTube. Before we get to that, though, I need to let you know you can get this series as a podcast anywhere in the world for free on all major podcasting platforms. Stitcher, Anchor, SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, and more. You can get this part of the I Love Value Investing podcast anywhere in the world for free. And if you like this video here on YouTube and our other videos, make sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell so you're notified every time we release a new video and release new videos all the time. Okay. So, if you see my other videos, I apologize for this. I don't want to do this. I have to do this because every time I don't, I get nasty comments. <laughs> so, this is for informational purposes only to help you learn how to value or to evaluate stocks better, faster, more efficiently. I do the I do not short sell ever. So any stock I talk natively about, I do not benefit from. Any stock I talk positively about, I also do not own any long position, so I don't benefit if I talk positively about a stock either. This is done for your informational purposes only at the request of viewers. Because these are at the request of viewers, I often don't know what the company does. Obviously, with Costco living in the US, I know what they do, but most companies I talk about, I do not know what they do. And I purposely keep it that way when I don't know what they do. Why? Because I don't want what they do to po uh, to bias me either negatively or positively. Um, and because of that, because he's at for your request, if I don't know what the company does, I also don't care about what the CEO says they're going to do, about how they're, the CEO says they're going to transform the world. Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on with the video here. Um, I don't care about what the CEO says they're going to do or this how the CEO says they're going to transform the world. I don't care about any of that right now. At this point, the company has to have um, margin of safety, has to have high profitability margins, has to be undervalued, has to have those things. Um, again, I don't care about that and other stuff until far later. Why should you listen to anything I have to say? So at this point in my career, nine years in, I produce average annual investment returns in the portfolios I manage of 23.5% per year. This puts me just behind the great Warren Buffett, who produced 24.2 average annual investment or 24.2% average annual investment returns at his Buffett limit, limited partnership. Now, I'm not saying it that to brag, frankly, I don't even like saying it at all. I'm not even saying it to compare myself to Warren Buffett. Um, the only reason I'm saying it is to prove to you that I actually know what I'm talking about a little bit. Okay, so again, apologize for that. Don't want to do it. Have to do it. Okay. Okay, so we are looking at Costco today. I will get to what they do in a second for those of you who don't know what they do. Um, but first thing that sticks out to me here they are at just under actually their um, year high, which frankly is not surprising because lots of stocks are near their all time highs as of this recording in November 1st, 2021. Stocks are still going straight up, so this is not surprising. I do pay a small dividend, market cap 217 billion. This catches my eye. Again, I don't care about forward PE at all, but when I do, I want it to be under 20. So this is one side the company might be enormously overvalued. Okay, so for those of you who do not know what Costco does, they are leading warehouse club. Um, Costco has 815 stores worldwide as of the end of fiscal 2021, with most sales derived in the US, 72%, and Canada at 14%. It sells memberships that allow customers to shop in its warehouses, which feature low prices on a limited product assortment. Costco mainly caters to individual shoppers, but roughly 20% of paid members carry business memberships. Food and sundries account for 40% of fiscal 2021 sales, with non-food merchandise 29%. Warehouse, ancillary, and other businesses such as fuel and pharmacy nearly 17%, and fresh food 14%. Costco's warehouses average around 146,000 square feet, 75% of its locations offer fuel. About 7% of Costco's global sales come from e-commerce, excluding same-day grocery and various other services. So, in other words, if you're not familiar with Costco in your part of the world, um, but you know what a Sam's Club is, because Sam's Club, I think, has more stores, at least um, as of a while ago, they had more stores worldwide. They are essentially a similar version to Sam's Club, um, which is run by Walmart. Okay, let's 
go over here, their revenue has skyrocketed in the last decade from 99.1 billion in 2012 to 195, 196 billion rounded up in the trailing 12 month period. That is, I knew they had grown. I did not know they had grown that much. That is frankly, insanely impressive. <laughs> Their operating margin in that time has gone up a little bit, um, which is not surprising to me because I know Costco has enormous competitive advantages. Um, so when their revenue goes up, mo what happens when most companies, when revenues go up, their operating margins either stay the same or they fall because they can't keep costs under control. They've actually risen slightly here, um, which means as the company's revenue has gone up by almost $100 billion in the last decade, um, they've done a very good job of keeping costs under control as they've continued growing. However, having said that, I look for, um, I should have said this, anything above 10% on a consistent basis here for um, operating profit margin, they do not meet my threshold even though their numbers are growing from 2.8% in 2012 to 3.4% in the trailing 12 month period. That does not meet my threshold. They have issued a small amount of shares, about 5 million shares in the last decade. That is not um, not good or bad, frankly. <laughs> it just kind of is what it is. Usually, I talk about either it's good or bad. Um, in this case, it's not really. It's just nominal. Book value per share is up pretty significantly uh, by about... $11 per share in the last decade from $28.59 per share in 2012 to $39.75 in the trailing 12 month period. Book value per share doesn't mean as much as it used to, um, but for a retail company, it does mean more. Like, um, like Costco, it does mean more. And this is a great indicator that the underlying intrinsic value of the company is going up over time as revenues rise. Um, we will see if some goodwill has been involved in that, which we'll talk about if and when that happens. But as of now, that is a great sign the company's um, underlying intrinsic value has gone up pretty significantly in the last decade. ROICs are fantastic. I look for anything about 10% on a consistent basis. Um, they're at 12.5% in 2012, and they're up to 18.2% in the trend and 12 month period. That shows me that while their operating profits are not, they have risen, but they have not um, risen significantly. This means they are investing their capital well and they are more profitable than they first look when it comes to their operating profit margin. Um, this is fantastic. This also shows me when compared to ROE that they have more debt now as a percentage of their balance sheet than they did in 2012. Um, frankly, that's probably not a huge deal because of how profitable they are, but we'll see when we get to the free cash flow sales for now. Their free cash or their ROICs are fantastic. Okay. Free cash flow to sales has also gone up um, in the last decade from 1.6%, rounded up in 2012 to 2.7% in the trailing 12 month period. This does not meet my threshold. I look for anything about 10% on a consistent basis. Um, but with this and the other margins going up as the company grows, we should expect these to continue growing, these margins to continue growing as the company continues skyrocketing its revenue. Okay. Not minimal short-term debt, small amount of long-term debt. We'll see the absolute numbers to see what that is. Long-term debt has gone up a decent amount. Um, but so has their cash flows and their operating profits. So it's probably not a huge deal, but again, we'll see that in a second. Um, nothing else of major note they are on this sheet. Okay, this is very good. Okay, so their cash convergence cycle has gone from positive 3.4 days in 2012 to negative 1.2 days in the trailing 12 month period. I'll get into why in a second, but when this goes negative, we've talked, I think, briefly about this before in other videos, but we haven't seen this in a while. So when this number falls, it's generally a good thing. 
it means the company is becoming more efficient, it's earning more profits um, as a percentage of sales, it's doing other things, which again, we saw with its operating profits, uh, the cash flow of sales, ROICs all going up in the last decade. This is an illustration of that. What happens when a company's cash conversion cycle goes negative? In, in a real world sense, it means the company is getting paid by its customers before it has to pay for whatever the inventory it is selling. For example, let's say Costco buys a bunch of clothing from um, suppliers. It gets paid, or it get, then it sells the clothing in stores and gets paid by the customers. This means when the cash order cycle is negative, they're getting paid by customers before they have to pay their suppliers. That is an amazing thing and usually is an indicator of massive competitive advantages, which I know Costco has. Um, specifically, economies of scale um, comes to mind as it's probably the biggest one off the top of my head um, for biggest competitive advantage for um, Costco. This has happened because there's taking them slightly less time to sell stuff. It's taking them slightly less time, or which means they have slightly less inventory and in stock, but it's mainly coming from their increased payables period. They're paying their suppliers lit a little bit later um, than they have been in the last, or at the beginning part of this decade. This all combines to show a negative cash conversion cycle now, which means that, again, that they are making money <clears throat> from their customers before they have to pay their suppliers for their products. You pretty much never see this, uh, a negative cash motor cycle, except for companies like Walmart and Amazon, and I don't even know if they still have negative cash motor cycles. I know they did years ago when I evaluated them. I don't know if they still do, but if you see this, that's a massive sign the company has potentially gigantic competitive advantages. Okay keep going so their debt levels have gone up <coughs> excuse me by about four billion just on four billion dollars three and a half billion dollars um, since 2019 frankly that's not a surprise companies took out a lot of debt last year in general because of the fears of COVID and they wanted cash on hand stuff like that Go to the quarterly numbers. About $12 billion in cash and short term investments on a hand. Good amount of inventory, accounts receivable, bunch of land and property and equipment. That is not a surprise. These stores are gigantic if you've never been into them before. amount of payables again they're a retail company essentially so that makes a lot of sense that they have retail or that they have a lot of stuff they have to pay for current debt and lease capital lease obligations is minimal at 800 million they are a 217 billion dollar company long-term debt and capital lease is 9.33 billion again while it's increased since 2019 that is minimal for a company of its size and how much uh, profits it produces. For example, um, they produced almost $9 billion in operating cash flow last year, which pretty much almost exactly covers their long-term debt and capital leases if they needed it to. They have, they produce far more cash um, than their debt, than they have in debt, and that gives them an enormous margin of safety. Balance sheet is incredibly clean, but their cash flow statement. So 
total cash generated from operating activities. That is a gigantic number. Nine, almost $9 billion, which we just talked about. They bought about $4 billion for the property, plant, and equipment. Uh, they bought about $1.3 billion in investments, and they sold about $1.45 million in investments. I would want to know what that is if I were going to invest in them further. It's not a huge number, so it's not a massive deal either way. I'd just be more curious. They bought back a little bit of stock, payments for common stock here. Issued a little bit of debt, paid back a little bit of debt, and their cash flow statement is incredibly clean as well. So at this stage, Costco looks at a good potential investment candidate uh, based on its enormous competitive advantages, even though its operating profits and free cash flow to sales don't meet my thresholds, I do know, again, because I've evaluated them before, unlike most companies we talk about, that they're, that they do have enormous competitive advantages. So even though they don't meet my thresholds on those two metrics, they meet my thresholds on pretty much everything else. So at this stage, I would continue researching them. Now, let's see what the valuation says though. Oops, and I already have the valuation up over here. Oh, so I figured they were going to be overvalued based on the PE, the four PE we saw earlier. I did not think they were going to be as overvalued as they are. And I'll get to why in a second. So again, I don't care much for PE, price of cash flow, forward PE at all. But when I do, I want these numbers to be under 20. PE is 43.6 right now. Price to cash flow is 24.4. Forward PE is 40.7, round it up. So this shows the company is massively overvalued on those metrics. The most important metric down here though, is this, enterprise value to EBIT. Uh, I look for anything below eight here, and this is at 31.4. So this shows that the company is enormously overvalued right now. Because of that, I would not continue for further research in Costco right now, uh, even though I know they will be a long-term good investment. They are so overvalued right now that I could not buy them. Uh, again, no matter how great the company is, I will never buy something when it's overvalued, ever. Um, I will only ever consider some buying something if it's great, if it's fairly valued at worst. Um, again, even in that case, I still prefer companies to be undervalued. In this case, Costco is enormously overvalued. So I would not continue doing research at this time, even though, again, I know that they're great, pro uh, they're a great potential long-term investment candidate. The returns, what this um, overvaluation means is that I would ex should expect lower investment returns for them going forward. Uh, and that is why I would not invest with them, or that is the main reason I would not invest with them or invest in them right now. Okay, let me bring the screen back. So again, I've evaluated Costco before. Uh, probably, I don't even remember last time, five years ago or so. A great potential investment over the long term. However, they have, and they also have enormous competitive advantages. Um, they earn consistently growing profits and revenues. Um, all their profitability metrics are up significantly or to a at least a decent degree over the last decade and still growing and should still continue to grow. Competitive advantages, um, economy to scale, cash motorcycle going negative, which again is rare. All these things are great, but they're so overvalued right now. I could not invest in them because when things are overvalued, it makes them more risky. It, it makes them more risky. It also means you should expect lower investment returns. If you are to buy them today, you should expect back to own lower or earn lower investment returns owning them over time because they're so overvalued. If for those reasons, I could not invest in them in the portfolios I manage right now. If you've owned them for a long time, overvaluation is not as big of a deal. Um, but buying them today, which again, I'm not a shareholder in this company, um, even though I valued them years ago, I didn't buy them because they were overvalued then. They're even more overvalued now. I could not buy them right now in the portfolios I manage for that reason. Um, I would add Costco to my watch list, but I cannot continue researching them right now because of how much they're overvalued. Again, if you own them already, that's a different story. Then it 
then you probably should continue to hold them if you think they're going to continue still doing great. You might want to sell some. Again, that's up to your personal preferences. Um, but as a potential new shareholder, I could not, cannot recommend them right now, and I could not buy them in the portfolios I manage. So this was for picnicking pillowcase. Great, uh, great case study analysis here, or great case study recommendation here. And thank you for that, as always, picnicking pillowcase. I hope to see your comments on YouTube about this, your questions, if I miss anything, if I should explain something better, all that. Again, if, and that's for everybody. If I miss something, if I should explain something better, if I didn't explain something well enough, let me know in the comments below. If you want me to look at a stock like this for you, like I did for Picnicking Pillowcase, and I think this is uh, third, second, third, fourth, somewhere in there, company I'm gonna look at for Picnicking Pillowcase, um, who requested this on YouTube. If you want me to look at a stock like this for you, let me know in the comments below. If it meets three criteria, can't be a bank because I don't evaluate banks. Can't be an insurance company because although I do know how to evaluate those and evaluate those well, you have to actually dig into the annual reports and that takes a lot, up, up a lot more time. And it also has to be producing revenue. Why does it have to be producing revenue? Because earlier, probably six, five, six months ago, now I evaluated some stocks that were not producing revenue and it was frankly pretty boring because again, at this stage, I don't care what a company does. I don't care what they say they're going to do. I don't care about any of that. It has to meet minimum criteria now and then I start the actual analysis and that stuff comes far later. Um, if it meets those three criteria, I will look at a stock anywhere in the world for you. Every stock for the last five, six months now and every stock for at least the next month or two to finish out the year is from a um, person who requested on YouTube or a masterclass student who requested that I look at a company for them as well. If you're looking for more specific help on how to become a better investor faster, make sure to check out our free resources below, including our five free gifts, which you can get the full preliminary analysis worksheet. Um, we just did the visual part of it. You can get the full worksheet so you can do this analysis yourself to become better and faster or to evaluate stocks better and faster. You can get that as part of our five free gifts below for free. You can also get a free PDF copy of my book, How to Value Us, and a free copy of our guide, Seven Takes Tips. Um, to picking great stocks and the three times you must sell. You can get all three of those for free at the links below. If you're watching on YouTube, YouTube make uh, thanks so much, first of all. Very much appreciate it. Make sure to like, love, share, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. If you do subscribe, make sure to hit the notification bell um, so you're notified every time we release a new video and release new videos all the time. You'll also be notified when we start up our lives again, which we plan to do at some point as well. If you're listening on the podcast, again, make sure to do all that same stuff. We'd very much appreciate it. But on the podcast, we'd also really appreciate a review because the more reviews, views, and listens we get our contact, the more people we can help. If you're looking for more specific help from me on how to become a better investor faster, make sure to check out the links for our masterclass, Value Investing Masterclass below, mastermind.valueinvestingjourney.com. Mastermind.valueinvestingjourney.com is the link. And in this program, you will not only have live group trainings, we just did one yesterday um, as of this recording, live group trainings where we cover any and everything the students want to learn. You'll have live access to the rest of the group and the students learn from them and to, to ask questions in our in our group, various groups, in our WhatsApp group and our Facebook, Facebook group. Sorry, I'm struggling today with the words. <laughs> and you'll get the masterclass, the Value Investing Masterclass, which has 85-ish videos and we're redoing those now, which is why I say 85-ish. You'll get quizzes, you'll get everything and resources, tools, templates. Um, you'll learn 23 of the different valuation techniques. You'll learn everything you need to know in this program to become a world-class value investor. Um, and you can find out more information about that at, again, mastermind.valueinvestingjourney.com, mastermind.valueinvestingjourney.com, or again, the link is below this as well. But until next time, have a great day. Talk soon. Bye.